I think that just as we're living in a nuclear age, we have grown so tremendously in scientific knowledge, it doesn't seem uh, too much to say that men can begin to awaken to the fact that they have, haven't grown enough spiritually and haven't recognized their spiritual capacities. Want something like eating is death. Then you've struck at the very heart of life. The enemy of the older radical theories may have been the ruling class. But today the stakes of whether we will reform ourselves into a new kind of human being, a new kind of society, whether we will find selves worth being, the stakes of it are simply life itself. As modernity has created promises that it has no ability to keep. What this means is that we're a society of disembedded individuals um, stuck in the impossible situation of being alone together. And what was understood as emancipation has proved to be a form of isolation. It is important to understand that what I am telling you is not simply a cultural history. It's a description of the story that shapes every single person that you know. This is why there is a rise in mental illness. It's absolutely concurrent with the disembedding of the individual because individuals can't constitute themselves by the very nature of the case. Subjectivity cannot sustain its own weight. We need others to tell us. But we've been given an ethical mandate by the Enlightenment that tells us that that's immoral, that nobody should constrain us. All right, well, we're back for our third episode in Dust Bowl Diatribes. And today we have a mainline Protestant minister who will remain anonymous so that we can all speak freely. Mainline Protestant denominations include Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians. This is an opportunity for us to get to know what it's like to be on the other side of the pulpit. So welcome, and let's get started. So first of all, just to get things started, I guess we need to know about how you see your own mission as a minister relative to the current moment. What do you think is special about this time in history, and how does your position as a minister intersect with that? Oh my goodness, start off the lightweight question. <laughs> I, I think, um, how do I see my mission as a minister? Um, I think I would say I'm about the intersection of sort of three things. Um, the intersection of, and yeah, I think that's what I mean. Um, the intersection of the reality of what the Bible says, in particular as it describes the truth of who Jesus is, and what he's about in this world. So that's kind of one piece. The second piece is very much the realities of what it means to be human in the world in which we, we live now. Um, and then the third piece is the, the reality of the gathering of God's people that I'm gonna use the word church to describe that. And I mean church in the broad sense and the narrow sense in terms of a local congregation, but also the bigger sense than that. Um, I feel like I think my mission is is the intersection of those three realities, those three things happening. Um, so I, I want to immerse myself in the scripture as as a text, um, as it as I believe it is the word of God, um, and and bears an authority like no other book in on the shelves of my and there are plenty of books on the shelves in my library, but like no other book. So so that piece, and in particular the focal point being Jesus Himself. That is the focal point of that book. Um, but, and then the, the realities of our world, the, the realities of the questions that we all bring to the table with, with regard to what is true, what is good, what is right, what is just. And the questions that people have been asking for literally all of our existence, probably. Um, in, in conjunction with, and then also when I talk about living in that world of uh, it's also the realities of living in this world where there's grave injustice around us, where there is where there is fracturing, where there is relational discord, and all all those pieces that are part of this world that are very real things that we can't ignore, we can't just bypass or pretend don't exist. And then the piece of the third piece in that is is the reality of that that there's this people who are called to be committed to one another, um, to worship and serve God, and to worship and to, or to, to worship and serve God and to love neighbor um, as, as the outworking of 
those first two realities. Um, and, and so in this cultural moment, um, boy, <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's the trick, I guess, is what does it look like to do that in this time, in this space where, um, where we have, you know, Christianity, the Bible, Jesus, it all gets co-opted for whatever your pet project or pet perspective on life is, right? I mean, I think that we see everybody use it, not everybody. We see a number of people, especially in, in our country, I think, taking those those names and titles upon themselves or wanting to associate with that because of whatever power it was they think was going to give them. And that gets distorted. Um, I think we have, we also, we also wrestle in this time and time and era of like, what does it mean to be human in the world in which we live? And what is it like for us to, to be honest about the world in which we live? Um, I think there's a, there's a fair amount of living in distraction and living in deception, um, that confuses that. And then, and then the whole, like, how do we do this together? Like, you know, is, is, is the Bible calling for us to be, um, not unified, but uniform? You know, I, I think, I think scripture calls the people of God, um, the church to be unified, to be together in mission and purpose. But I don't think it's expected to be uniform. I don't think we're expected. I think that's different from like we ought to be identical with each other. So I think that's part of the challenge there. And with that, like, so how do we disagree on important questions and not important questions and still get along and still be connected with one another? I mean, that's the challenge of life right now. So this is my initial response to your question. Okay, and just to follow up on that, um, could you kind of characterize, uh, because you're alluding to the fact that there's quite a bit of fracturing on the basis of politics as far as your denomination goes, can you kind of locate it on the basis of some of those hot button issues like gay marriage, abortion, the environment, things like that? Sure, um, yeah, our, I mean, <sighs> Anytime you talk about denomination, you're talking about, a, you know, thousands of people, um, for the most, most part, um, at least thousands of people. Um, and so to, to, to have one answer to all those questions is, is tricky because obviously there's some nuance. Um, my denomination is, is, would be in a conservative bent, um, to, say, to, to say the least. And what I mean by that is we would have uh, a very hot, what we would describe as a high view of the Bible. So the Bible is the inherent word of God, inerrant, inherent, inerrant word of God. It is infallible. It is trustworthy. It is our, it is our ultimate authority in life and practice and worship. Um, we take it, we take it seriously. Um, I'm trying to avoid using the word, the word literally, because that's a loaded word. Um, but we, we would, we would say that, but that's like, that's made for a whole other conversation at some point. But, um, anyway, that's, I'm going to try, I'm trying to not use that word because it's not, it's kind of a loaded word. Um, so on hot button issues, um, we would be, we would be very squarely in the pro-life camp. Um, I think for the most part, or pretty much across the board, um, I think the, um, the question of sexual morality um, there's a little bit of variance in my world, but not a ton, um, in terms of there's some different perspectives on how we respond to those issues. Um, things like the environment is something that, for the most part, um, you know, is not something that's even on our radar, to be honest with you. Um, I would say, I, with the exception, I will say, I think with the younger generation, I forget that I'm, I'm 48, with the younger folks, I think that's changing. Um, but I, I would say as a broad sweep, you know, in kind of the world I inhabit, that's just not even on the radar um, in terms of, of that. Um, race is an interesting discussion in, in my world because there are, there are definitely some folks in, our, in my denomination that are that have worked very hard at, um, at facing the racial issues in our country with great honesty and great diligence. Um, but there are others who are very much you know, we, we, we throw the word woke around a lot as a pejorative term and like some folks that I know do. And so that's, that's a tricky, that's, that's a difficult thing, but there's, there's some variance in that regard. Um, 
our denomination, you know, has made statements about r racial issues and, and trying to seek some um, repentance and forgiveness in, in that regard. Um, so, yeah, so our, you know, so my world is very much, again, the other loaded word that I'm trying to avoid using, but I can be used is we're in the evangelical camp, I think. Um, I don't use that term for myself solely because of the, it, it describes, a, it seems to describe more political bent than anything else now, but that's probably a faithful way to describe, generally speaking, and I don't reject that term outright because I think historically it's an important word. Um, but I think in our in our day and age, it's just not helpful. And and what exactly do you find unhelpful about that word that you, in, in a broad sense, do identify with, but in the stricter present day moment, makes you queasy? Well, I mean, you know, historically and grammatically, the word evangelical comes from the word the Greek word oiangelia, which is the word for gospel. Um, that's the noun form of it anyway. Um, and so historically, I'm like, yeah, we're gospel people. That's what we're about, um, which I think kind of became in vogue during the Reformation. I think is where, historically where that term came in. Um, but man, now it's like, it, it has everything to do with voting Republican <laughs> and, and, and being a white suburbanite and going to a big church where there's, there's music that's really trying to be cool. And um, and lights and and be hip and relevant and all that kind of stuff. And I just that's just not where I am, um, you know. And I think it, you know, it's it's like anytime I hear that that word on the news or in you know or read it in print in the context of like the evangelicals are saying this, I'm like, what? I don't, you know, I I just find it very hard to identify with because I don't think it's it's such a broad term now with heavy political implications. Um, which I'm, you know, again, I'm light on the history, but I know at least during, you know, the, was it the moral majority and that the Ralph Reed and those folks in the eighties where that really became a big voting block kind of situation. Um, so that's why I don't, is it, is it, is it, does that get your question, Spencer, or do you want to dig more from, I'm not trying to be vague on it. I'm just, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, whatever, whatever you want to say about it, um, you know, we're pretty we're clearly pretty critical of the evangelical, but we're also Catholics, so. <laughs> yeah, and, and I would, I guess I would say in that regard, so, so to dig into that a little bit more, you know, part of the struggle I have is that for me, evangelical means sort of baby boomer version of American Christianity is, is kind of the, what that associates for me, which, which means not tied to Christian history very much, not tied to thinking deeply about one's faith, um, having kind of quick answers for everything, um, very much a, uh, almost an easy believism kind of mentality. Um, and, and, I, and I'm acknowledging that this is all from a stereotype standpoint, and so I'm not trying to create a straw man here by any means, but, but that's kind of where my head goes. And so even, um, I mean, as you know, as a kid, I grew up in a Baptist context, um, and I remember going to college. And in college, was the first time that I had met. I hope this comes out okay. Was the first time I met Catholics who were actually thinking deep, more deeply about their faith, and it was very much a personal thing for them. And that kind of weirded me out. And I didn't know what to do with that. Um, but now I'm like, I have. I mean, you guys are among several good friends in life, like people like kind of good friends who are Catholic, and, and I don't say that you're not Christians, but there are a lot of people in the evangelical world that would make that distinction, I, th I think. Um, again, I'm not trying to create a straw man, but um, like I'm going to look at, I'm not going to gloss over the fact that we have differences in, in doctrine and practice, but at the same time, like I, we're worshiping the same Jesus, and I think, and I would look at I mean, I'm reading, you know, I read, I, I try to read outside of my, my lane at times. I'm reading a book by Henry Nowen um, right now that I'm really enjoying. It's been really helpful for me in processing some things. Um, and there are others that, that, there are the ways that I would look at Catholicism and say, like, we're not like two different worlds, um, you know? And so in, in that sense, and I think in my, in my mind, evangelicalism is not going to go there necessarily. Um, and as freely as others would. And so I'd like to think that I've learned the value of, of tradition and history that I think is really rich in, in the Catholic tradition, for sure. 
that is that is not always been a part of my faith, and so kind of growing in that is what I would say. So, could you characterize the state of the health of your denomination? Um, is it healthy? Is it thriving? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I would say it's it's relatively healthy and growing. Um, in that, in in at least I think by the numbers it is. I mean, you know, the last three years have been rough on everybody. I know that church attendance is down and all those, those things, but um, I think it's relatively healthy. Um, one, um, I wanted to make this distinction. Um, use the word mainline to categorize us. We're, that's not a term we would use for ourselves. Um, so when, when I think of mainline, I think of for lack of a better term, I mean, you know, being in a small town, mainline are the big churches that all the important people in the, in the, in the city go to um, and kind of divide up and go to outside. Of the, and mainline, I think, typically would define a Protestant, so not the Catholic church, but sort of the big steeple churches downtown. <laughs> you guys, I think you know what I'm talking about, Lori. Um, you know, and, and so we're a little bit more sectarian than that. Um, so we're, we're not quite in terms of like the big, um, you know, Methodist or Presbyterian or Episcopalian. Um, and so in that sense, we're, we're a little bit on the, on the sidelines. We're an offshoot of that. And, um, you know, is the, from the, if you know much about the 20th century history of Protestantism as the, what we would call the mainline churches were wrestling with things like German liberalism and higher level criticism. Um, there were all kinds of offshoots of, um, of churches that would reject a lot of that approach to scripture to hold to the, to the, to the direct truth of scripture and we're a part of that church of that does that make sense um so in in that sense from what i've heard and again this is all don't don't quote me that is too much here but um from what i understand the mainline churches in general have been struggling probably over the last 20 30 years in terms of numbers going down um we're not growing in gangbusters i don't know that i would say we're thriving but I think we are growing. Um, and I think there's a steady incline overall in the upward direction overall. And and do you have any sense of if those two things are connected? Like is the is the mainline version of whatever denomination you are, to some extent, are they feeding you as as a certain amount of those people get disillusioned with like the the for lack of a better term, the liberalization of the liberalization and the liquidation of of that. Yeah, I don't, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's hearsay um, for me because um, I'm sure it's more complicated than I want to think it is. But I, I, I think I think the narrative that I often hear is something along the lines of when you stand for everything, you don't stand for anything kind of mentality. And so, um, and, and that's, 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 I'll acknowledge that's probably not a fair characterization fully, but, um, you know, I think I, I've talked to folks, you know, that were a part of, that have been a part of some of the larger mainline denominations. And it just, just kind of came to a point where they're like, what do we believe in? You know, that doesn't feel like we believe in anything anymore. And what's the point? And so why would we stick around for that? Um, I don't think it's as simple as that, but I don't, but I also don't think it doesn't include that as well. I think that's part of the issue. And so I think, um, you know, I think when there's, when, when you reject the, the authority and the truth of scripture um, and kind of make it, kind of make it be what you want it to be, um, I, I think that's problematic. And, and I think, I think that's not going to challenge people and that's not going to draw people. But but I'll be honest with you too. As soon as I say that, I'm like, that sounds really pragmatic too, to be like, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to put on this conservative hat because this is what's going to get people in the doors. And that's not right either. Um, but I think that that's the narrative that we often wrestle with in here. And, and I do think there's some truth in that. Um, you know, that if, you know, it's a kind of situation where like, um, if you're going to a church that doesn't, that, you know, that doesn't seem to believe in much. Um, and then tragedy happens in your life. Like, what do you do with that? Like, is there something to hang on to? 
Um, and there's some, there's a little bit of cliche in there, but I think there's some truth in there as well. So we wanted to know how you felt when you do, you know, your teaching in church. In other words, do you do you feel like when um, you're preaching, when you're talking to the people, um, that you're conveying what you want to convey? Are you in any sense like, um, you know, feeling constrained or do you feel free to pretty much um, say, say what you think? Oh boy. <laughs> Good question. Um, the pastor, the pastor answer um, in part, and, and I mean this too, if I'm smiling as I say it too, is I'm constrained by the word of God. And so, you know, in my, in my practice and in, in, in my church's practice and, and, and such, um, one of the things that we value really highly is we don't want to bind anyone's conscience is the phrase we use apart from what the word of God says. So if I can give you an example, um, you know, something like um, I have good friends who homeschool their children. I have good friends who send their kids to Christian school. I have good friends who send their kids to public school. Um, I think there are great biblical reasons to do all three of those things, and there are really bad non-biblical reasons to do all three of those things. And I think in, in so in, in, in that setting, um, I cannot in good conscience say, pick one of the three and say, this is the biblical way to do this. And if you're not doing it this way, you are sinning. That's what I mean by binding the conscience. And so in that sense, I really, I, I want to strive to, to preach and teach what the, what, what I understand the word of God to be saying, um, and to be consistent with that. Um, so in that sense, that's, that's where my, that's where my conscience lies. Um, now that's, that's part of the answer to your question. But there's the, 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 the other part of that is, especially in today's day and age, um, the Bible says some things that are pretty disconcerting, <laughs> you know, and, and, and pretty disruptive, to say the, to say the least. Um, you know, and, and, and that's where, you know, I, I'm going to lean into, and I'll, I'll even say something like this, like I'll say if I'm preaching on something that, you know, okay, here's a, here's a, good, a good example. Um, it's my conviction, and I think I can prove this biblically, that sex outside of marriage is wrong, is, is, is a sin. Um, now, when I'm preaching to college students, which I do on occasion, um, I will say that to them because I think I'm bound by my conscience to the word of God to say that that clearly. But I will also be quick to say, I know that this may be hard for some of you to hear. And I know that this may be, this may cut against how you how you understand. I mean, I've you know I've sat with students where I've had this conversation, and the students have been in tears because you know that means I can't sleep with my boyfriend anymore, and that means a lot to me, and that's important. Like I, I am not trying to oversimplify this, and I don't think the Bible oversimplifies it either. Um, but I'm bound to say what what I understand the Word of God to say. Um, and so in, in that sense, no, so, so, you know, let's, let's talk about the book of James. The book of James has a lot to say about the wealthy and about the abuse of power and the abuse of, and the use of systems to, to abuse the poor. Like in, 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 in a wealthy or suburban context, those can be really dangerous words to say, to be honest with you. Um, it's still, I'm still bound on my conscience to say those things. Um, you know, I was reading in, um, I think it was Amos, um, which is one of the earlier prophets. Um, and man, he talks about trampling the poor underfoot and like all this language where like, you know, if this was not in the scriptures, you know, a lot of folks would read this and say like, that sounds really woke to me. Um, you know, that doesn't, that sounds pretty communistic or whatever, but it's like, but that's what it says. So I'm bound to say that. Um, so all that being said, I mean, I have to be careful you know, in all honesty. I would like to think that my concern is more to be clear and and that I'm gonna I'm gonna labor over my words to be clear and to make sure that they can be heard um in the context that I'm in. But I'll but I'll be the first to tell you I'm 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 a, I'm a I'm a flawed human being in that regard. 
Um, and I and I and I would be foolish to say that it doesn't it, that it that would never affect what I say. If that makes sense, does that does that make sense? Okay. This is maybe an aside, but I think it's connected. So I grew up kind of non-denominational, and then we filtered into these more moderate Mennonites for a while. And I don't know if it's a matter of hardness or heart, but or what, but uh, I've always found it weird that you can be part of a conservative denomination and you can accept a lot of hard things, say about like the sacrifice required to be personally, sexually pure. Um, people can swallow that and say, yes, we're good, but don't ask me to think uh, forget about hard. Don't ask me to think at all about the systematic way in which I'm privileged and taking advantage of the poor. Basically, don't get too woke, even if Old Testament prophets and Jesus were woke in these departments. Um, how can they go so far, but then stop just as other people go the other way and say, yeah, let's talk about social justice, but don't what, tell me what, what to do in the privacy of my bedroom. Uh, what do you think about that? Man, that's that you nailed it, Spencer. Um, I mean, that's the issue, right? Um, because we want to pick and choose. We all want to pick and choose what we're comfortable with. Um, you know, it's easy. Um, I'm trying to give an example. Um, yeah, it's yeah. You you know why is that the case? Because we're because that's that's what it needs to be. You know, sinful human beings. I mean, I think I tend to, you know, one of my default kind of positions or things that I go to often in my own thought is I think we're all about control. And I think as human beings on this side of Genesis 3, and, and I think I think that's that's what it is. It's like we're going to control the stuff either that we don't struggle with or that we do struggle with that we hate in ourselves. I think it's probably one of those two things. Um, and so it's easy for me to, to, to cast dispersion to somebody who your struggles is something that I just don't struggle with. Um, you know, that is that that may not be an, an issue for me. Um, you know, in the same sense that it is for somebody else, um, or something like that. I mean, I think we pick and choose and, and I think we want I think nuance is, is undervalued. I think uh, I mean it's, there's a whole um Spencer, you changed my life when you introduced me to the wire, um, almost literally. And uh the um there's a quotation, I don't know if I ever shared it with you, or maybe you, I got it from you. There's a quotation of, from the creator of that show about, like, you can't, you can't, like, define, you can't define life in a sentence or something like that. And, like, we, we often try to, I'll have to look it up some point, at some point. But it's something about, like, we, we try to minimize our explanations for everything to a sentence or two. It's like, it just doesn't, like, the world doesn't work that way. It's too complex. Um, and I, I think that's that's a lot of what you're getting at. It's like, if I can make it so that, okay, me being right before God is based on how I view this, the beginning of human life, I'm going to have a cut and dry answer to that question. Bam, I'm set. I don't have to, I don't have to wrestle with what's hard. Um, I don't have to wrestle with the implications of that beyond that. Beyond the walls of intelligence, life is defined. I'm and especially if, you know, if, you know, I, you know, think about it in this, in the context of, um, like I get the reality of, I get the reality of as a as a as a as a white male in his late forties. Like for for me to talk about abortion with someone who's not a white male in his forties, like I gotta acknowledge like there's things there's realities to this discussion that I don't understand because they're not part of my experience. No, I still hold firmly to my convictions that I'm not trying to be wishy washy, but I but I, I need to be quick to understand like. We see things differently because of our experience and because of, I mean, I, you know, I have this conversation with students on a somewhat regular basis because I'm just in a different world than them um, in, in that sense. And so I think, um, I think we like to pick and choose what's, what makes sense to us and we want to be cut and dry because we want to be in control. And I think we want full explanations for stuff. And if I can say, this is, this is the answer to such and such social problem, you know, then, then that's it. And, 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 that, and that's all it is. Um, and I can go on to the next thing and I have to wrestle with it. You know, I mean, you know, because the, the, the pro-life issue is a great example um, in that, you know, when we talk about, and I think we had this conversation recently, but, you know, in, when we think about being pro-life, um, what about end-of-life issues? Because that's part of the deal. 
you know, we don't like to think about antibiotic issues. And then there's the whole, you know, there's the, the thing about like the death penalty and, and, and related issues to that. And, and maybe we need to talk about just, just the, the, the nature of life in prisons in general, you know, as a, pro, as, a, as a pro-life issue in terms of how people are being treated. And, and what about, um, you know, what about the, the, um, you know, the foster care system? And the, you know, all, it, it, it extrapolates out. And it, all of a sudden, you know, in two minutes, we went from one issue to a myriad of issues and those are all interrelated and those are all connected um and i just don't i don't think we like to think that way i think we like to think in terms of concrete specific things and let it be done at that and it's just really hard is that the main problem that you see with christianity right now uh is because that's a big one. I, I agree with you that that inability to kind of think about the complexity and to be, you know, consistent in your values and at the same time merciful with, with them, all of that. I agree about all of that. Is is that like if you had to identify one thing that really is holding people back, I guess, would, would that be it or, or is it um, something else? Oh, that's a good question. Um two things are coming to mind now. I think that's part of it. Actually, so that'd be the two other things in addition to what to kind of the, the need for control. Um, I think with that is, I think, I, I, I tell people all the time, one of, the, one of the things that I want people to hear from me when I preach and teach is the Bible defines love as sacrifice. Um, first and foremost, you know, when it calls us to love one another in, in the book of First John in chapters three and four, the assumption is it's going to cost me something. Um, you know, when when the Apostle Paul talks about marriage, I know we want we got to figure out the whole submission thing and what that means, and that's complicated. But the, the thing we don't like to talk about as much is the sacrifice that he calls us to, and that's 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 how love is defined, even outside of marriage, even in relationships with one another. He does the same thing in, in chapters four and five of Ephesians. Um, so I think I think sacrifice scares the tar out of us, um, and I but I think that's what we're called to. And you know I you know I I'll say to young people all the time, um, if he says he loves you, and it doesn't cost him anything, then it's not love. And, and if he's not willing to sacrifice for you, to give of himself for you, it's not love. You need to know that. Um, that's in the context of dating relationships where that comes from. Um, so I think I think the, the the call to sacrifice and and the the nature of that is what terrifies us, um, which takes to the other main thing. I think fear um, is is huge element in this. You know, the the fear of what does this mean for my family? What does this mean for my kids? What does this mean for my, my parents? And and you know, hear me say, you know, I think it's right for us to protect our children. I think it's right for us to. To, to want to do that, and I'm not belittling that. You no, know, this is not a free for all. But you know, we've learned with our kids, we would rather have the discussion. And my life is stellar, better, far better at this than I am. We would we would rather have discussions with them about difficult things now than not have the discussion and have to face the, them figuring out on their own later. And, and I feel like I'm getting off track there a little bit. But my point is, my point is, we often want to shelter and kind of hide in our bunker, have a bunker mentality. Um, and I think the things that, you know, yeah, I think the things that y'all care about and, and kind of help me understand better, like calls us out of that. And like, Spencer, I remember you telling me stories about, um, Kim, it was when you were, you were doing maybe your summer internship, the paper you wrote, and something about like the would the drug the drugs somebody under on, on drugs come to come to the door or something like that. And you tell me this story that I, I think you wrote it down in one of your reports, and I don't know if you remember any of this or not. But you're just telling me this story about interaction that you had with somebody who was on drugs and like came came to, like late at night to the place where you were staying and asking for money or something like that, and like like I'm sure that scared you on some level, but you're kind of like this is random, this is what I got to do, and I'm Try to respond as best I can. I'm butchering the story, but that's a memory that I have from from you. And um, you know, it's like because it costs us stuff. 
you know, it's like, you know, even, so, so, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place here. I think fear is a big part of it. We're scared of what's going to happen and what it's going to mean for us and what's, what the results are going to be. Um, but you know, you know, things that I've, I've had to learn, it's like, it's things like, um, you know, if I loan a tool to student, which I'm, which I'm trying to be all about loaning my tools out because I've got a bunch because most of them were given to me. And I try to try to loan them out as much as I can. I gotta know. I mean, I mean, I get that back, and that's okay. Simple example, I, I realize. But I think, I think the need for control, the, the the reality of sacrifice, and the reality of fear are probably some of the key things that, that most of us wrestle with. And again, on some level, those are not unique to Christianity. Those are unique to those are part of what it means to be human and being finite creatures in this world. But I think those are. Those are probably the, the main things that I would say that we really wrestle with. And would it be fair to, while you were talking about this, like what came to mind is I heard somebody say recently that they were, I, th- I think it was in the context of a mainstream American Christianity. The problem is they want Christianity, but they don't want the cross or they'll take their pet issues. Yes. Uh, you know, I believe we should have social justice, but don't come after my <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's a great way to say it, Spencer, actually, you know, Christianity without the cross. Very, very much so. That's exactly right. I've heard that as I've read that as well, too. I can't remember where, but I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great way to say it, for sure. Because that's at the, it's at the heart of it, right? I mean, Jesus said, if you're going to, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross daily, you know, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me, I'm butchering that. But I mean, I don't know, that's what he says. It's like, okay. Yeah, that's part of the deal. Yeah. And then the question is, how far do you go along, along that? Do I, do I have to become poor? Do I, you know, how much do I have to sacrifice? And, and, and I think, and I want to be quick to say too, we're all in process in that. And, and I want to be careful not to create a burden that my people can't bear in that or that. And, and again, I realize this, this may sound like I'm limping out on this, but I, I just think it's important to acknowledge, like, I get that it may take us time to get there, and it's going to take each of us personally kind of where we are in life. Um, like, you know, especially you live in a very, in a different work, different way than I do, and for me to pick up my family and move into one of your house, move into your house, <laughs> that, that'd probably be a stretch for us, and that probably would not be right for me and my, for my, to do to what my wife and my kids. But I need to be in conversation with you to understand what you're doing, because it's helpful for me to learn how that what that looks like in my life, and it's and and there's a place for us to still learn from that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And I'm and I'm fine with like holding those tensions together. Where where I tend to get uncomfortable is is that, and I'm not saying you're doing that, but that type of argument can turn into if you're not being vigilant enough. Well. Yeah, it's fine. I need I need three million in my four hundred one k, you know, and that's just that's just my path. That's my way. And then and then you're in this weird situation where like conservatives and people that are trying to be traditional are are talking like the people on the other side of the political spectrum that they, that they don't like. Yeah, 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 and, then, and that's that's a good correction for me too, for sure, because we can, yeah, you can kind of use that as excuse to not do anything. Yeah, if and and again, I'm not accusing you of this, but if when when the fact that we're dialoguing at all is a, is a total substitute for well, then what are we doing with that dialogue? Are we being transformed by that dialogue? Which yeah, we, we, ex- that's exactly right. Which again, you know, back to my to my initial my initial comment about that's why the church is such an important part of this of this vision for me is because that's how it's going to happen. It's like I got to rub against people who are different from me. And I've got to, I've got to be in a conversation that's more than just small chat, more than just small talk, you know, before, right after the service, but that actually has substantive and is actually like learning and growing and being transformative, like you're saying, for sure. Yeah. And it seems to me that part of uh, that cruciform openness to others is required just to be able to like actually hear what another person is saying forget about like radical self-sacrifice this is required um just to hear somebody over your own loud thoughts um and i guess that leads me to our next question which is how do you feel about the state of your 
extra church community, like like the life of the people that go to your church outside of outside of the liturgy on Sundays. Yeah, um, I actually think that's something we really put high value in, um, and, and that can always seen. Um, I, you know, so I, I grew up in a home. Uh, my parents are, are Christians, and we, I grew up in, in, a church, in a church setting. We were at church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Um, but my parents actually often, they put a high value on having people in our home. Um, you know, I think, I think I've heard it described as I probably grew up in a pretty open home. You know, Thanksgiving, there's there's a there's a single man who's now retired who's been coming to our family's Thanksgiving meals for like thirty or forty years, thirty years, and he still comes. He was there this year because he's part of our church community. My parents um, are where I grew up. They're they're from they're not from there, and so they've always had heart for people who were who moved there and had no family nearby. And so Thanksgiving was always, we had a house full of people. Um, we've had people stay with us. Um, my brother had a friend whose parents were divorced. Dad was an alcoholic. Just a really rough situation. He lived with us for a while. Um, and so um, I grew up with this model of like, you have people in your home. Not to, to, not to sell them Amway, but to just get to know them and love them well. Um, and that's just part of what we did. And so, and I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't always love that. And I still struggle with that on some level to this day. But um, the church communities, that I tell you that because the church communities that I've been a part of and I'm a part of now, I like, have always valued that. Um, you know, we were in, in terms of like, it's, it's not a weird thing for, for us to be in someone else's home or to have people in our home, um, you know, for a meal, to play games, to hang out, um, to celebrate the 4th of July, whatever. It's like, it's just a very natural part of my life, and and I think our the churches that I've been a part of um, have have really valued that as well. And so we see the importance of sitting down with one another, sharing a meal. Um, you, know, the, you know, even even to the extent that you know I've been working vocationally as a pastor for about twenty years now, almost twenty years, and. Um, you know, and part of my budget line has always been um, expense line for food. Um, and so like, I, it's very common for me to have lunch or dinner with people, either in our home or to go out with them. It's, I realize there's a difference there, you know, going out to food with somebody but versus being in our home. But um, we put a high value on that. And, and because the, the unhurried time together is really important and the shared life experience together. Um, you know, there have been times when my job has looked like going to hang out at the rec center and play ping pong with students um, as a part of this. Like, we're going to we're gonna not just do the liturgy together. We're not just going to do the study together. We're going to experience life together outside. Um, I love playing pickleball. It's my, one of my new favorite things to do, and, and it's kind of part of the deal. You know, it's like, it's like we, this, is, this is good for us to do this together. Um, and so... Um, I've had a really positive experience. Again, it's it's not perfect. It's it's hard. It's awkward. Um, you know, there are times when you sit down with somebody that conversation's just not flowing, <laughs> and it's like this is part of the deal. Um, but I've been really encouraged by that that reality and, and that practice, and it's been something that's been pretty highly valued. Uh, we talk about it at our church all the time. Um, you know, if you need something, call us. Let us know. Um, you know, we've had people come over and do laundry in our home because they didn't have a washer, washer, washer and dryer at their house, or they have to pay for it. Like, come on over, bring, you know, bring your bring books, whatever you need to do. Um, you know, things like that. We we give rides to people when they need it. Um, you know, the the group me thing is a is a handy thing. You know, Sunday mornings when someone needs a ride somewhere. You know, and 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 the the funny thing is, you know, we're we're learning that there are students that, in particular, in our world who. Like that kind of feels weird to them. Like, do I really? I really don't want to ask for a ride. And like, no, look, we, you know, we're going from here to here, from here to here. You're in between. You're on our way. It's not out of our way to do this. This is not. It's not a distraction from our work. It's part of who we are. So, um, it's something that's highly valued, Spencer, for me for sure. And so, as it relates to kind of what we've been talking about so far, and. The question of are some people in your congregation resistant to say asking somebody for a ride somewhere or to have help doing their laundry or, or caring for an older relative or something um, 
one of the things we're trying to do with the Morin Academy is to like truly come to grips with the nature of capitalism. Um, do you have anything to say about capitalism in itself and, and how that manifests in people trying to be independent of other people? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I feel like the, the weekly answer that I want to give is that there's not a better system. <laughs> um, and so it's what we got. And, and, um, and this is honestly where I would lean up to you guys because you guys are much better read on this than me. Um, I, I think in the sense, I, and, and I, you know, uh, you know, full disclosure, you know, I grew up in a pretty conservative part of the country. I read Rush Limbaugh's first book as a high school student for fun. Um, and so, just to acknowledge that, um, you know, and I think, um, and my dad's very much very conservative in his, in his ideology as well. Um, so I think there's a part of me that's really, I really resist wanting to say capitalism is the problem. I think that the, the cheap answer is greed is the problem. Um, you know, you know, the whole, you know, that, that whole deal, um, which is probably the typical response that you guys hear. Um, I, I do believe that on some level, which I don't think we confront our greed nearly enough. Um, back to when, you know, I had a friend who said once, you know, we're all about, we're all about wanting people to confess sexual sin, but we're not, we're not going to talk about confessing our greed. And, and, and I, I think there's some reality to that. Um, so, but, but that being said, I, I think, um, I think there's some, there's, there's got to be some senses in which capitalism is part of the problem as well. Um, I don't know that I could speak on it very authoritatively or, or fully, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if it is in the same, in the sense of like, if we've created this system and it's all about accumulation and more stuff and cheaper stuff and getting more crap out there to sell, like that's not really good. Um, and you know, that's not, that's not helping anybody. Um, you know, it's not helping anybody socially, which I think is maybe what you're talking about, Lori, but you know, what I learned from you guys too is like environmentally and, and even physically from our health standpoint, it's not good for us. I mean, so, I mean, it's like extrapolates out and all this stuff, you know, more cheaper, faster is not necessarily a great way to live. You know, I think, I think is what we can, what we would say. And I think that that's certainly what some aspects of capitalism are going to tell us, right? Is that more products, cheaper, done faster. Now, you know, I ordered stuff on Amazon two days ago, or two days ago, and it came yesterday, and I was pretty darn excited, I'm not going to lie. Um, but, um, but at the same time, I think we've got to confront that on some level. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, there's this reality of, like, yeah, it, we got to think about this stuff more than we have, for sure. And uh, we wanted to make sure to ask what you think of the Catholic worker movement um, or, or other attempts to kind of have a more radical Christian lifestyle to, um, I don't know, as, as we say in Catholicism, like sanctify the temporal order. Yeah, I mean, you know, thankfully you reminded me of the, the main tenets of the Catholic worker movement, which are expensive, so thank you for that. You know, I think... Um, let, let me let me answer in a way that I don't expect me to answer. Um, I don't love the word radical um, because in evangelicalism that gets co-opted for like we're gonna we're gonna be on fire and we're gonna change the world and and then we're gonna give up after two weeks kind of thing. You know, it's kind of the the, the world that that so that's why I wrestle wrestle with that word a little bit. Um, but I think you know from what I see, I mean from interacting with you guys in particular on um, a lot of these topics over the last years, um, I really, grew, I'd like to think I've grown a lot in my understanding and my appreciation for what you, what you're doing and, and to see it as, um, you know, I think the intersection of like trying to figure out how to live, live healthy in a, in a fuller kind of way, you know, relationally, which I think is part of it intellectually, um, to be intellectually consistent, intellectually honest, um, to strive for hospitality. I mean, I think those things are really good. Um, you, you know, I think it's, um, and, and I think we need to live with an awareness of that need. You know, I mean, like I was saying earlier, things like, um, Laura, you and I were talking about this last week, I think. Um, you know, the whole, like, I can't find a tool, so I'm going to go buy, buy another one, and then I find my box of five tools that are just that are identical. Like, that's, that's my life right now, because I've got my father-in-law's tools now. 
um, as we move them out of their house, you know, and so it's like, oh man, that's how we live. Um, and I think things like learning to live in community is something we need to do better. Um, and I, my hunch is that the Catholic worker movement could function um, as sort of a microcosmic view of the way and, and, it, and influence us, the rest of us to live that way in, in a broader way, if that makes sense. Um, and, and that may be part of the vision, it may not be, but I feel like on some level, um, it, 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 it can be that and it should be that for us. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think we need to disparage that. I, I think I, I think the nature of our world is like it's just not working for a lot of people. Like, you know, I mean, think about it. Let me back up and think about it in this way. You know, we talk, we think a lot, I think a lot about as my daughter's a college freshman and we're like facing the realities of like the finances of what it means to send your kid to college in this day, this day and age. Um, but also knowing, knowing young people who are like, I'm not sure that a four year college is what you need right now. Like, it, you know, let's not assume that that's the case. Let's not assume that they need to live one way. And, and maybe we need to be thinking more broadly about those kinds of issues. Um, and I feel like there's an intersection point there with the Catholic work movement, from what I know of, of, of kind of shared life and, and learning and growing together um, and having this experience together that seems to be um, seems to be something important for us to be aware of and something important for us to wrestle with. Um, I don't, I don't know if I'm getting at you, what you're asking, Spencer, or not. Um, but I, I, I get from, from the little bit I've seen, and, and obviously most of this is from knowing you, Spencer. I mean, I get the value of it. Like, I don't think you're crazy for doing what you're doing most of the time, anyway. Um, you know, I, I, I think what you're doing is like you're trying to live consistently with what you know to be true, and this is where it's leading you. And I don't say that in a like purely subjective, I don't mean to be saying that in a true like you do you, Spencer, be subjective, subjective kind of thing. That's not what I'm saying. Um, I think the rest of us probably have a lot to learn from that, from what the Catholic Worker Movement values and is about um, in a way that, that really could transform our communities in ways that we don't even acknowledge it. So one of the things we're interested in is is the social phenomenon of what's called specifically in Catholicism, but it has its mirror in other denominations. We're told is traditionalism um, and their uh, codependency on on their so-called opposites, which are the progressives. And on the one hand, we're we're sympathetic to traditionalists because they rightly see that we are in a very problematic situation and we've lost touch with our past. But on the other hand, they tend to have like an overly romanticized and fundamentalist perspective on their tradition. Um, at least that's our take. Uh, what's your take uh, for good or bad or both? Yeah, it's um, yeah, yeah, it's hard. Um, yeah, th there's a there's a decent amount of tension in my world with regard to what your labels of traditionalism versus progressivism. In my world, it's not you know if we we like to joke that you know the most progressive person in our denomination is still really conservative, um, and that's a reality. Um, and it'd be laughable, you know, to think about us as progressives in any way, shape, or form, but it's, it's the label that gets tossed out. Um, I think the, the best of traditionalism says, hang on, let me think about this for a second. Um, the best of the traditional, of traditionalism says, let's, Let's learn from the past and not not throw the baby out the bathwater. You know, let's let's see the value in where we've come from. Let's not recreate the wheel. That kind of stuff. Um, I think the best of progressivism says 
we need to be really honest about our failures and we need to be we need to we need to face those with truth and reality um i think the problem is when those two sides can't even dialogue we can't even learn and grow from one another um then we're all done i mean that, that's that's the that's the hard part when when the traditionalist view um is so absolute and the progressive view is so absolute that um you know, you know it's, it's it's sort of like when the traditionalist doesn't see the harm that the rigidness is causing to the people in the congregation. And when the progressive, again, I'm using these terms really loosely, of course, when the progressive does not see, cannot see beyond the immediate passion and and realize that we've been down, we may have been on this path before that we need to learn from. Like when that when when those things don't happen, we're stuck and, and we just we're not helping anybody. Again, I get and I realize there's some stereotype in that, but I, I think that in broad strokes that's what I see. Um, you know, I think um, yeah, it's you know, it's it's it would be sort of like saying like, do we really need to re? I don't know, I don't know if this is happening. Cause I'm not trying to create a straw man, but like, you know, in in my mind, the Nicene Creed is really helpful, you know, from a doctrinal standpoint, and like articulates some things that there's great mystery there, and there's a lot to understand and unpack there, but. But boy, they had something right. Do we really need to rewrite that all the time? And I don't, I don't know if that's happening, but like things like that, where I'm like, I think the tr the tradition of the the old ways of being aware of things, I think is good. Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun, and that counts for both the traditionalists and the, the, the progressives in, in this conversation. Like we got to be aware of like, yeah, there's nothing new. I mean, is you know to take the example of as jacked up as we think. Um, issues of sexual morality are in, in the 21st century. If you know anything about the first century in ancient, you know, in ancient from before that, in ancient Roman, ancient Greece, there's pretty messed up stuff going on there too. And let's not pretend that we're the first people to to deal with sexual problems, sexual morality problems, or race issues, or you know, fill in the blank. I mean, it's like, come on, <laughs> um, we have to we have to be willing to have those conversations. You know, and I and I think, and I think we need both sides of it. Honestly, I really do think that we really need. I don't think the I don't think the win is to kick out the traditionalists. Um, I don't think that's the win. Um, nor do I think the win is to squash the progressives. Um, and and but I think that's the way we act a lot. I don't I don't know if in your circles, if it's in the Catholic circles, if it, if that's kind of kind of how it feels sometimes, but. I think it, it's easy for me to fall in that that place of saying we don't need this group or we don't need this group. They just need to go and get out of here. And I think in some more sober moments, I'm like, nah. I think we really, need, I, I really, I push it this time. I really do think we need each other. This is where I've even as I've taken this Catholic turn, what I find enduringly attractive about the Christian anarchist position, and what I take to be the essential core of it is this. Um, and it's kind of pulled from Rene Girard, but I think it's more than just him. This idea that at the core of the Christian ethos is you get... So, and it kind of follows with something we were talking about earlier, but I often um, think that, um, you know, and it doesn't matter Protestant or Catholic, I've been to a lot of different churches and I've been several denominations of Protestant actually, but a lot of times um, pastors like will talk at such kind of a high general level that you can interpret so many different ways that a singular message can't be drawn out of it and that has always made it I don't I don't I don't even want to engage in in like trying to, to decipher it you know so I as somebody who's you know done a lot of preaching and and studied homiletics and all of that um what what exactly is that? It sounds like you because you have sort of a guiding star of of the you know I thought you t articulated really well that you you're kind of bound by the scripture and that kind of like reigns you in um, and I assume that means also that you ground what you say in it. Um, I mean, can you kind of I mean this might be a little unfair, but can you speak to why it is that the um, homilies and sermons are often like that from 
you know, is, uh, you know what I'm trying to say? Like where, where a person can just sort of kind of think whatever they want to think while listening. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question, Lori. Um, I mean, I think on some of, I mean, I'm guilty of that. Like I tend to be more of like an idealistic kind of 30,000 feet, big picture kind of person and not a detailed person. So I, I think on some level, I think that could be said of me on, on, in some, some ways and some days. Um, I, I think it happens partially because we we're tr- we we realize that we're speaking to a room of people, not one person, and there's a variety of perspectives. And it's and it's really hard, uh, honestly. Um, even in the, with the best of intentions, it's really hard to do that at times. Um, you know, it's I, I think about um, an example. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you know, knowing you know, speaking about topics where, you know, I know that somebody in the room has had an abortion, um, which has happened to me before, um, or, you know, knowing stuff about people losing their jobs, or, like, knowing the people's stories that, it's, that you're talking to can make it a challenge. I mean, it's all, it's make it easier at times, but um, I think, um, yeah, I think in the best of cases, we're, 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 we're striving to be sensitive to that and it can be difficult, but, but, uh, but, but we're still people and we live in the fear of man more than we should. And I think to land the plane, um, again, in my world, that kind of comes down to like, can I, can I tell someone this is sin if it's not sin? Or can I say that you must do this? Um, I think there is a certain amount in which it's right to protect them. But I also think, that, I mean, there have been times when I'm just like, yeah, I'm trying to give an example. Um, well, yeah, I mean, here's an example. You know, this is if I'm ever if if I'm ever talking about if I'm ever talking to young people and talking about dating relationships, um, you know, I will not mince words about abuse. Um, you know, if 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 this is happening to you, you need to leave. Like, you need to get out of the house now. Um, that kind of language. I think we we need to hold that without. We need to do that. Um, that's a little bit more cut and dry. Um, but I think I think the challenge is to be prophetic when we need to be prophetic, when, when the word takes us there. Um, and, I, and I think that's, um, I think we can do that more clearly than we realize, but I think it's, hard, it's still hard. I don't know if I'm getting at your question or not, but I, I think, um, you know, I, I yeah. I mean, the, the, I mean, just to be honest with you guys, the realities of, of, of pulpit life is um, if, if the church has a mortgage that they're trying to pay off and, you know, there's these realities like, am I going to make someone mad and they're going to leave? Um, there are times when their wisdom dictates to not be rash and foolish in what you say, but there are times when di- wisdom dictates that you need to be consistent and clear. And I think knowing the difference there is, is, is really important. Um, I mean, you know, to, to, to go in, you know, again, I'm not trying to make too much of this, but like in our town here, to go in to a, to a pulpit where most of the congregation is white, I think, you know, I'm guessing our churches are fairly divided here, not exclusively, but, and not intentionally necessarily, I'm not calling everybody racist, I'm just saying. The reality is, you know, our, there's probably a pretty strong divide here in town um, between between white and black in particular, to go into an all-white church and 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 start out by railing against racism is probably not going to be effective. Does that mean we don't address the issue? No, we need to address the issue. As scripture guides us to do that. But to go in and simply say, you know, to, to go in rashly, I think there's wise there's ways of doing things like that. What I keep coming back to, because I'm pulled towards more radical things, you know, trying to get to the root of things, let's not try to prune stuff, let's just tie a chain around that tree and tow it. Um, What I hear you calling for is, I hear you making prudential judgments about uh, what we call a mortal sin, and then there's these more venial sins. Let's work with it, let's be patient, let's try to accompany people gradually instead of, oh, there's a fire, we need to get out of the building right now. Oh, that's your question. <laughs> um, and could I just add to that? Um, one of the big issues, as you know, for us, 
is the environment and climate change. Um, from our perspective, the whole planet is on fire and our children and their children are going to be hit with some very serious ramifications of that. Is there a place for, as you mentioned, a lot of Christians don't even want to think about it, but is there a place for pastors to kind of raise that issue to the level of importance as if you said, no, get out of the house, like you said in your um, previous uh, example about sexual morality? Um, because it's not that you might get hit by a hurricane, um, but it's even more likely that my son or my son's kids might get displaced or experience scarcity. So what do you think of that, both how your denomination deals with it and what the responsibility is of a pastor on that topic? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, and it's funny, and I actually thought about that before, believe it or not. Um, it's probably not a surprise, I guess. Um, I I would want and it and I think this is where you guys actually help for me in starting to think about this is I would want to think about and I would need to think about again not to give the cop out answer, but I would want to think about where that ties into the scriptures, honestly. Um and I and I think I have some answers for that actually not just off the cup of the I mean I think I think it's not accidental that the way that the people of God were called to treat the land in the old testament was as specific as it was, you know, the year of fallow and all that kind of stuff. And um, my hunch is that there's a lot more to that than we give credit credence to um, in terms of that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, but but in all honesty, like the whole, I go back to the first book we read, I read it to you guys, the Holland book, I'm in Barcelona. Like, holy crud. Like, you know, the whole, like, the whole thing about, like, the chickens get sick when we put them in the big, the big, big stockyards and so we got to pump them full of medication or whatever just to make it so they're less sick and can that really be good for us um i mean that kind of stuff is like um I mean, there's real real things there that i think they're part of the deal um you know i can tell you that you know in in my circles um if i were to talk about health and climate change from the pulpit i get laughed off the stage um you know because and for a lot of folks, they just don't agree with it. They don't. They don't think it's a thing. Now, again, I think that's changing with the younger generations. Um, to, to some extent, I think I think some of the younger generation is much more aware of some of those kind of issues and much more into that. But um, but I think uh, things like um, you know, like the community garden idea. Um, which I don't even know if that's still a thing anymore. I've, I've heard of churches doing things like that. I think there's some benefit to that if it can be done well. But I, if I remember it, I think you probably also had some headaches and trying to figure out some of that kind of stuff. Um, and it's not been easy. Um, but but, but all, in all honesty, like, I know, I know people um, in my circle that will share fruits and vegetables um, from their gardens um, in, in part to be aware of things like that. And to, to, so in a, in a very practical way that they've taken steps towards that, they cut down on the meat that they eat um, because of health reasons, which I think is part of the deal. So kind of holistically in that sense. Um, but I think, I don't even know if this is possible, but I, I feel like, I feel like for a lot of people, the, all the all folks here when we talk about climate change is the political ideology behind one view or the other or what they perceive to be just simply pure political ideology and they can't get past that and and i don't I, i'd have to give some time to think about how we would do that in a way of like you know let's let's think about this in terms of in terms of our life together as a community and, and how we would flesh that out because I think it's so wrapped up in like, well, you're just being a liberal, you know. I mean, that's what, you know, you're an SJW, you're being a liberal. I don't have to think about that, so I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. um, and, which, again, I'm sure you guys have run into far more than I have, but um, that's what I would, yeah. Well, and it seems to me that there are two things going on. One, there's a cynicism about how these ideas are intrinsically leftist, globalist, totalitarian, satanic, etc. 
And two, it feeds into a kind of eschatological cynicism where it's like, before Jesus comes back, things are going to get absolutely apocalyptic. And therefore, what good would it possibly do to our to reduce our emissions? And, and I think, to be honest with you, Spencer, I think, thankfully, that's changing. Um, I think, I think, and, you know, I feel like I hear more and more people like not, not, not left in that kind of, kind of that, that mindset, but I know that that still exists. Um, I'd like to think that's changing somewhat, though. Well, and it... Again, th- th- this is speculation, but I wonder to what extent it is because of that kind of like Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth, that from that to left behind, which I remember picking up in middle school and just reading just because like it, it was like a thing people talked about. But I, I, I don't know. I, I guess those ideas aren't as I, I hear you saying they're not as pressing. Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's fine. I, I didn't know that you wrote left behind that question. I read the first one and couldn't do any more. I was just like, no, I'm done. Um, it was freaking out too much. It was just that good. Um, yeah. But and, anyway, I, yeah, I mean, I, from what I've heard, those, the, those, those, those perspectives on those issues are less forefront than they used to be. Again, I think the other generation is seeing that more fully. It's like they're more aware, um, at least, at least in thought than, you know, it's kind of like with race, you know, issues of racism. I think we've come a long way, and I think the younger generations are facing it more fully than than even my generation did. But are we? I and mean, you know, are we? Are we near got it fixed? Oh, how heck no! You know, I mean, it's it's just not. You know, those are still huge issues for us. So, um, but I think if you were to talk to even younger evangelicals, folks who use that terminology, I think they would say, they, they would say, yeah, the planet is something that climate change is something they care about pretty deeply. Um, but then you got the the others that say it's, it's a myth, and it's just you got the, the littles are making up so they control us. I guess you've addressed this already in a way, but it just feels like um, I want to address that kind of dismissal um, a little bit more because I'm certainly around people who do a lot of that same thing, like politicizing it immediately. The thing is, though, people need to understand that that functions very well to keep people from doing anything at all about it because we can just keep people, we can bicker back and forth about whether it even exists. As a professor, I'm in a different situation. I've got tenure. I literally can't be fired except for cause. I try to be nice about it, but in my classes, if I think that it's important, I will just tell them the truth of the matter. Um, You guys, you serve at the will of the people that you serve, basically. Professors still feel some pressure, but they're not hired and fired by their students, um, as Protestant ministers really kind of are by by their parishioners. Is there something to be said about that model, uh, that model of hiring as an impediment to communication? You aren't hired for life by the organization. And you don't have tenure. Is that something that might be a problem, not just for the environment issue, but in a lot of ways? Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that is part of the challenge for sure. Um, but, you know, I think, though, I, I go back to to your question about the Catholic Working Movement, I think that's the, the value in that in, in what you're doing. I mean, I, I remember, like, when we when we first started Book Club and we moved it here to your house, Lori, and, um, and like, we started sharing meals together. Like, the beauty of that was you were modeling something for us. We, we were all pretty in at the time, I mean, of course, but um, at the same time, the beauty of what you were doing, and I think the beauty of what the Catholic Working Movement is about what you're doing, Spencer, is is you're actually saying you're actually putting forth an alternative. Like you're not just griping, Spencer, or not not just griping at all, but you're not just griping about what's wrong with the world. You're actually trying to do something about it. And I think there's something to be said there for um for that and, and for an approach that says, um, I may not be able to convince you that that global warming is a thing and that, that we've got a problem with the environment that we're that we're not we're not doing things healthy, but I can show you a better alternative. Um, and I can put something on display for you and live in a way that's different. Um, and, and encourage, no, that's hard and that takes patience. 
And I do think there's a time where you got to take the gloves off and go for it. I mean, I do think, especially your question earlier, I mean, I think there's a time when you try to change the chain to the chain and just yank it. Um, but, you know, that's just kind of, you got to figure out how to do that and when to do that. But um, but I, I think, and again, maybe that's, maybe I'm being weaselly again, but I feel like from a, from a practical approach, I think we show people an alternative. Is this part of the solution or part of the response, the helpful response? Um, you know, and and we, um, yeah, because I, I just I think I think people need to experience it and see it um, because they're you know it, 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 because their experience is so much like, and in our world it's so much like the liberals are over there and the conservatives are over here. And we're we're just doing this again further and further apart, right? And we're we're not willing to engage with each other in honest ways. Um, and so I think anything that we can do to to introduce and to help people experience something they need to experience, it's like, oh, this is actually really good. I'm glad I did this. This is helpful. Um, and again, that's I re I realize that that position may be really naive on my part as well, um, but I I think that. I think that that's at least part of it.